Now there's two options that a semi-occupied country like Germany can respond to the victors after a war. So Germany had just been defeated and really there's two ways a country can respond to that. Um, one, they can choose to resist and fight against any terms that their occupiers come with. So let's look at Germany for example. Germany was not impressed with the with what happened at Versailles. They're semi-occupied, okay, saying they can't have a military, they need to demilitarize, they have to make all these payments and such. One way to deal with this is to resist, 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 but they're defeated. And if you think about it, they're weakened. And so really this becomes exhausting for them. Now the other side of the coin is they can choose to cooperate until they're eventually strong enough to challenge who the victors are and what their terms are. Now if you think about it though, this could be very demoralizing for your own people. Okay, If your own people are seeing that they're completely um, succumbing to the Versailles Treaty and everything that the victors say that they need to do, people, are getting, people can become upset. Um, they can become demoralized and really in the end they might lose their will to fight against it. Gustav Stressmann, I hope you like my German, he chose to cooperate and buy time. He thought this was the best opportunity for Germany to be able to survive. And now, he's an interesting guy. If you look at his background, he's the son of a beer distributor and he was born in Berlin in 1878. All right, this guy is pretty, pretty German. All right, he built his career espounding views of pro-conservative bourgeois national liberal party. Now, um, when I say he's pretty German, I mean he's very nationalistic. His original views on foreign policy reflected the conventional conservative wisdom. Germany, he believed that Germany was lured to war by Britain, who was jealous and eager to preserve its own primacy. Okay, as late as 1917, he even advocated vast conquests of both the East and West, as well as annexation of French and British colonial possessions in Asia and Africa. All right, he supported unrestricted submarine warfare, and he originally called the Treaty of Versailles the greatest swindle in history. So we understand this guy is very nationalistic, German pride, and those other guys over there are not our friends. The reason why I tell you this is to let you know that the Course Companion isn't always 100% in regards to everything that it says. It really kind of paints this guy in a, in a positive light that he was a hero and such. But if you look into it, you know, he might have had some different views later on that he might have wanted to accomplish. Although, as we'll see, the, he won't go through with that. And it'll be more on the positive side of what he does. Now, his breakthrough came from his appointment as Chancellor in Germany. For one, he called off the passive resistance in the Ruhr, all those protesters, and he agreed to continue payments of Versailles. Now, the French agreed because of how Ruhr was a complete economic failure for them, and it also put them into an incredibly bad light in regard to our own allies, okay? The, the states and the British were not impressed with what France was doing. The key player to solving the whole Ruhr crisis was a man that went by the name of Charles Dawes. He came up with the Dawes plan. And in this plan, um, he, he came up with the idea to uh, decrease and extend the time frame for German reparation payments. So basically make it a lot easier on Germany to make her payments. Now the US would loan, would even loan Germany money to pay her allies and um, a lot of American private capital then flowed into German businesses and German governmental bonds. So the U.S. really made a big investment in, into Germany because they believed in the same type of thing that um, England believed, where really Germany had to recover in order for Europe to recover. Strong Germany means strong Europe means no war. And Stressmann went along with this and this becomes known as the policy of fulfillment. Okay, this is a really important term to know. 
Now, this is the idea that trying to avoid Versailles punishment was not working. Instead, Germany would try her best to make reparations, and through being a good citizen and cooperating, the Allies then would take pity on her and revise the treaty. This ended up being very successful, and it gained a number of concessions for Germany and rehabilitated her international reputation. And this, this policy of fulfillment would actually stay in place until Hitler took over. And so this ends up leading into Locarno. Now, Germany decided to accept its current boundaries with France and Belgium. Up to this point, Germany was not happy with these boundaries in the West. And, and through the policy of fulfillment, Germany decided it would be best to accept them. And so they decided to cooperate by having these boundaries enforced by an international treaty. And this was definitely welcomed by Britain and, her, and the new French um, Prime Minister, Aristide Brand. I apologize for poor pronunciation. And so, in October 1925, the Locarno Treaty was signed, and Germany was also even allowed to join the League of Nations. Now, this seemed like a genuine breakthrough in Franco-German relations due to the fact that France finally felt safe with this guarantee. And now, really, Germany was allowed to recover on her own. However, this guarantee did not happen in the East. And so Germany kind of was left to think that maybe she'd be able to expand uh, without much interference by the Allies. This temptation might be a little too tough to resist a little bit later. But regardless, this still left a, a sense of euphoria in the West because they felt Germany had finally accepted Versailles and things were going good. And this continued for the next few years. Okay, Germany joined the League. Um, the Allies, they even removed their troops from the left bank of the Rhine, all right, between Germany and France. And an Allied commission to supervise German disarmament departed by 1927. Now, the Kellogg Brand Pact was eventually signed by 65 countries in 1928. And what this did was it essentially condemned war as an instrument of national policy. Okay, so they all, you know, people like to sign these treaties that are wonderful and such. And so, 65 countries condemned war as an instrument of national policy. Great thing. Now, Locarno was proof that World War I and its tensions had finally been dealt with and the world could move on. And if you think, also, communism at this point hadn't spread beyond the USSR. So, you know, you think about it, life's going good at this point. This is why they really call it the spirit of Locarno. Okay, it's, it's a beautiful time period. Things are going well. But... If you look deeper, you can see there may have been a couple problems. If you think about it, the League at this point was still very weak and collective security was not something generally accepted. Germany also still had the Rapallo Treaty and the unguaranteed borders on the east kind of showed Germany was willing to possibly retake some of this land if they were willing to work with the communists with Rapallo. One last thing that we're going to see is that the spirit of Locarno, this whole time period, really was closely linked to the economic prosperity of Europe in the 1920s. I'd like you guys to think about what happens in regards to this economic prosperity in the end of the 1920s and into the 1930s. That's where we're going to begin to look into next. But for now, what I want you to do is go on to the Moodle. The next assignment is there for you. What you need to do is compare everything that was stated in this lecture. Um, this lecture is based off of the course companion, basically. And you need to compare what they talk about Locarno in that, in the course companion, and compare it to um, what Kissinger says in his book. And then you need to write an essay comparing and contrasting the two of them. We're really going to look at the point of views and how 
it, how two different sources can talk about the same thing but come to different conclusions. And then what you're going to have to do is then argue kind of which you agree with. Okay? All the instructions are on the Moodle, so please go there now, read up, and uh, begin reading Kissinger, and make notes about what you see is different in his portrayal of Locarno. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day.